Grace Bible Church, Pearlside, online. Father. Father. Your perception of who God is in your life determines how you pray to Him. Is He an entity, entity that, that judges, judges you from, from heaven, heaven on a golden throne? throne? Or is He your heavenly Father? No will is mine. Pastor Norman Nakanishi concludes our series, But, but God, God Can, with his message entitled, Barrier Busting Prayer. We are here as an answer to prayer. We leapfrogged over 30 organizations by the favor of the LCC administration who took a chance on a church. And it's been a wonderful home for us for 10 and a half years. We have our new place as an answer to prayer, but really every answer to prayer faces a barrier before the breakthrough. And the lack of understanding in this, in the cacophony of theology that's going off on the internet today is bringing confusion. And let me start today by saying this. Our prayers are both heard and opposed immediately. I want to say that again. Our prayers are both heard and opposed immediately. We've been in the life of the great prophet Daniel, impregnable character, right? Impeccable integrity. This is one of the few men in scripture where nothing bad is said about him. No sin is revealed about this great prophet. He has a great vision as we looked at last week as the apostle John, the revelator of the Old Testament. Remember, the book of Daniel is the book of revelation of the Old Covenant or Old Testament. The book of Revelation is the book of the apocalypse or the unveiling in the New Testament. Daniel is John's twin. He is the seer in the Old Testament with whom God trusts with a glimpse into the day of the end of the age and the end of the world preceding the coming of Jesus Christ. And he is freaking his mind out. This is 538 years before Jesus would ever come as the Messiah. And he, God is allowing him to see the end from the beginning. And he's crying out to God for an understanding and the answer does not come right away and it's just stressing him out. How many of you have been ever stressed before waiting for an answer to, to your prayers to come? I have. This has been a journey of three years going into the new place and every six months talking to Leeward and saying, has the money been approved to deconstruct this? Because that would leave over 3,000 people homeless on a weekend. And all the time we learn that God is in control. He is sovereignly in control, but he wants to partner with us to, so we revel in, his, in, in the victory together, although he gets all of the glory. Our prayers are both heard and opposed right away, and, and then the answer comes, and he encounters the angel Gabriel, who is the messenger angel in Scripture. Do not be afraid, Daniel, since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard. Wow. Just like God's heard your words. With your prayers and I have and, and, and I have come in response to them but the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days now the language here refers to angelic forces okay then Michael who is the warrior the fighter angel in scripture then Michael one of the chief princes came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia now I have come to explain to you what will happen to your people in the future for the vision concerns a time yet to come the writer in Hebrews, who most theologians, scholars, and historians believe to be the Apostle Paul, writes, and speaking of the angels, says, he makes his angels spirits and his servants flames of fire. And not all angels minister, are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation. It is true there is an, an angel assigned to you. And so the song, you are my special angel. Just got to throw that in there. Just came to my mind. A bit of humor. And when you pray, angels are involved with delivering your answer. But there are opposing angelic forces that try to prevent the delivery of your answer. And so we talk about barrier-busting prayer because angelic opposition and spiritual warfare is very real. See, God can do it without us, but he chooses not to. 
He made us because we are made to bring him glory and to have a relationship with him. He gets all the glory, but we share in, he gets, he lets us share in the victory so that our worship of him and our love for him is magnified. It's a partnership. It's a convergence and a synergy. There's conflict and there's victory, but let, look, at, look at what happens when you pray. Let, let me paint you a picture. When you pray to our Father, as we've looked at in this series, the Lord's Prayer, it's an outline, a template. It's not really a prayer, but we've made it into a prayer in the West over decades, over centuries. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed, holy, awesome is your name. We, we start prayer by making God big and remembering who he is, that he put us under this, that, it, that he's awesome, he loves us, he sent his son to die for us. Incredible. And then we pray the big picture and he puts us in his, into his picture as we said last week. And in all of this, Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, Scripture says, praying with us and for us. The Son of God who went to the cross, resurrected and ascended at the right hand of Father, sharing in the very magnitude of the glory of God the Father, is at the right hand of the Father and he's praying with us and for us, and when we pray, he prays with us and for us. That is a powerful picture. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit, who broods over the earth, who lives in us once we receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior, or the Lord, we ask the Lord into our hearts. The inhabitation of God is by the Holy Spirit living in us, and the Spirit of God moves upon the earth and moves angelic forces to bring the materialization of the answer to your prayer. And so, as the angelic forces move to bring circumstances together, relationships, and sets the stage, there are demonic angelic forces that oppose the movement of God's emissaries. Look at the chaos you create when you begin to pray. This is what's not seen and what's not taught enough about prayer. That is why sometimes there are simple prayers get answered really quickly. The grace of our Father for little children, like Kali's niece, God, as a loving Father, protects little children from excessive demonic wear to prove to them right off the bat that He is Abba Father. But as we grow in our walk with Jesus, guess what? He allows us to go through prayers that have to go through battle to grow our faith and to, to, to understand that as Ephesians says, we are not only a family, a temple, and the bride, we are an army. The book of Ephesians gives us multiple pictures of what the church is like. And the one that we in Hawaii are weakest at is that the church is also an army. Let me remind us that, that really scripture says we are an army, we are on a mission we have the hospital and the infirmary on the side. But in the West, we've made the church the hospital with an army on the side. And that's why people don't like to evangelize. They don't like to share their faith. They say, it's not my job, it's not my gift. No, actually, Jesus' last words was, go make disciples. In fact, he says in Mark 16, the other version of the Great Commission, preach the gospel to every creature and I will work with you with signs following. It's my power, but through you. It's my glory because of my son, but I want to do it through you. This is the, and, and, and the enemy of our souls, Satan, Lucifer, he does not want that. And so when we pray, he puts barriers in the way, and Daniel faced one of them because it was this, this was an epic revelation that would span centuries and centuries to come. Daniel, 538 years before Christ ever came, saw the day we lived in. He must have looked at helicopters and shuttles and, and airplanes. He was freaking his mind out. Tanks, bombs. He must have gone, oh my God. What is this? And some of you are in oh my God moments. You've been praying for your spouse. You've been praying for your children. You've been praying for your grandchildren. You've been praying for your business. You've been praying for the government. You've been praying for relationships on the job. You say, why hasn't it changed? God, where you stay? Where are you? Can you relate to that? In going from this place to our new place, there have been immense battles on an international scale because it was an international negotiation. Next level, next devil. And the, and the inability to grasp this truth because the internet theology that poo-poo's a lot of this stuff today, 
we go back to scripture, it is very for, important for us to understand that there are barrier-busting prayers we need to pray. Now, Darnisha and Scott Taylor are scuba divers. And one of the favorite places they love to, to dive is in Hawaii. But they took a foray into Crystal Lake, Michigan, which is a different, different kind of diving, much colder waters. And something went wrong with Darnisha's breathing apparatus. And so she surfaces, but with 50 to 70 pounds more of weight, and she knows she has a only a limited amount of time to fix it or else. So I want you to watch this, and we're going to talk about this as we process this truth together. Take a look. I was starting to get winded and tired. So I thought, well, before I run out of air, <laughs> let me fill out my BC manually, which is really the first thing that you're supposed to do. So I went to depress the valve to fill it up, and, I, and no air would go in. That was like, okay, this is not going to work. So I started really feeling like I'm in trouble. So I started praying, God, please send my husband to the surface. Please let him know that I need help. Darnisha struggled for several minutes. She had no more strength to stay afloat. I remember one of my final prayers to the Lord being, okay, Father, if this is your will, then I'm gonna trust you to take care of everything that needs to be taken care of. That was the moment I shut my eyes and said, okay, Lord, just help me to swim straight. And uh, that's when I drifted off into eternity. Got up to the surface, but was kind of surprised when, um, as I went up, um, that I, you know, she was not around or not hanging on the line. I did a 360 a couple times, um, looking around. So I started looking for air bubbles on the surface. I woke up on my knees in this place that was, the only way that I can describe it is it was a room, but it had no walls. It was just a wide open, bright space. It was so um, peaceful. It was very pure. In the distance, I, I could tell there was this great destination, this gateway, this, 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 this place that people were entering into. I remember feeling like I was home, even though it didn't necessarily look like my, my house, it was a place that I knew I was welcomed. Darnisha saw other people in her vision, and one of them in particular caught her attention. We didn't talk, though, but we communicated. And it was as if she was asking me, are you, are you coming? And I um, didn't know what to say. The anxiety started increasing there a little bit more. I started doing a spin. I started yelling, yelling her name out. Scott finally saw his wife. She was 200 yards away. He swam toward her. I kept uh, uh, popping back up to the surface to adjust my bearings to make sure I was swimming in that direction. By the time Scott reached Darnisha, she was sinking to the bottom of the lake. Everything went black. And I started reacting like, what just happened? I'm home, why are they bothering me? And that was the moment that I remembered what happened with the accident and that I had drowned. Be before that, in this peaceful place, I didn't remember any of that. I remember having to talk to myself and say, okay, I have a decision to make. And I remember actually having to specifically make the decision, do I stay or do I come back? I heard clearly, you need to relax and let him bring you back. And so I said, okay. And I inhaled and allowed the process to happen. Absolute miracle that I could, I, I, that I even found her in that lake. So I had her, uh, my arm around her, uh, the back and just pounding as hard as I could on her chest and uh, breathed into her mouth. And uh, that first breath just uh, 
the, the first air coming back out of her lungs wasn't her breathing yet was just horrifying because all I could hear was the, the water gurgling in her lungs. Scott spotted a boat and he screamed for help. As soon as the boat cut its engines, the first thing I heard was prayers of all three of the people on the boat praying and, and crying out to Jesus for help. As soon as we got her up, she coughed out all the water out of her lungs um, and started breathing. Scott and Darnisha were taken to shore. He drove her to the nearest hospital 45 minutes away. After MRI tests and x-rays, Darnisha was treated and released the same day. The report that the doctor gave back was, it, it looks really great. It looks like she, it doesn't even hardly look like she had this type of an accident. And there are so many people that God has behind the scenes on earth and in the heavenlies that are working for our benefit and for our good. That powerful? She's to relax and let the Lord bring you back because others behind the scenes and he says, people but forces on earth and in the heavenlies that are praying. People in the boat were praying. She prayed. He prayed. Do you think it was lazy, casual, bless my food prayers? The kind that we all pray for lunch? See, the scripture says in James 5, 16, the, the effective fervent, and that word fervent in the original language means intense, hot prayers. Do you, are some prayers easy prayers for you? They are for me. And then there are prayers, you know, like, Help Hawaii football win again? <laughs> Choose the right AD? I'm inserting humor because it's an intense subject, but listen, there are prayers we pray and then there are prayers we really pray, right? There are life and death prayers. The fervency here was, it was between life and death. And for some of you, the intensity, if it goes up, God is gonna give you breakthrough because we take him for granted if it comes too easily and he knows that. And that's why sometimes he lets the opposition come so opposition brings gratitude and worship. For those of us, most of us here have been parents and we understand that we didn't want to spoil our kids by giving them stuff too easily. We let them fight for it, right? Now, it's true, God is grace and his favor and he, he, we don't earn our salvation, neither do we earn his approval. But as we walk with him, the same lessons are given as we learn to fight a very real enemy and it comes through barrier busting prayer. This is what Jesus says. Barriers are broken through prayers that are boldly ridiculous and shameless. And I paraphrased here this passage in Luke 11. Jesus said to them, his disciples, suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door is already locked and my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your, and here is, I love the translation of the new NIV, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. Jesus is teaching us about how to pray. Pray with shameless audacity, pray with swagger, pray with confidence, pray with boldness, pray with fervency, pray with intensity. Don't just pray relaxed, lazy, passive, oh, God's got this kind of prayers. It's a country that you have to go through all the passage in the scripture to find out the discipline and the power and the grace of prayer, not just a few selected pet passages. And these are the ones that especially we in Hawaii need to get, that really intensity is not insanity. People, I watch the laid-back people of Hawaii manifest as they go through rail construction traffic. Watch people in their cars. Some of you fought that today as they closed three lanes. If you came from this way, you came through a parking lot just to get through the freeway, and then you got off the freeway onto Kamehameha Highway, onto Acacia Road, and onto Mauna Loa Road, and you went from the freeway to a parking lot. Or maybe it's not you. You got here early enough. Wait for the 11 o'clock service. When they come in, they're fuming. They're hot, they're fanning, and I'm amazed that they're here. Very special people who fight to get here. Folks, there are times God will allow us to understand next level, next devil. And that's what Daniel faced. This was such a revelatory re uh, a vision that the enemy did not want him to get it. It took three weeks for him to get the, in the, the inkling of it, and yet, what happened? 
He was heard immediately, but he was opposed immediately. And for some of you, you haven't received answers to your prayer yet because there's a significance to that answer that the enemy does not want you to have. Keep on praying. And pray with intensity. Especially if you know what you're praying for is right. And it's cool. You know what? I'm going to walk to this side. I always walk to that side. Okay? It's because of all this stuff over here. You need to pray with intensity. Are the drumsticks here? We got time. Okay. I have no idea. Garen, forgive me. Okay. Some of you, you whoa, I almost fell down. Okay. Some of you, you pray. Say, oh, God, never work. Lord, I thought you loved me. Will you stay? See, but some of you need to pray. You know what I mean? You need to pray like that. And you need to keep on playing and keep on praying and keep on coming until that barrier breaks. You need to have some fight. This is true. When I was a chaplain for the UH football team, we were in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. It cussed the chaplain over there. I'm Asian. We're in the South. Go figure. I was with Neil Everett, who I didn't know who Neil Everett was at that time. We hung out the whole game. And I would, there were times I was behind Coach Jones on my knees praying. Because I said, there is so much arrogance in this stinking stadium. They think Alabama thinks they're God. Jerry Glanville told me they, they are God. <laughs> and I sat there, and for the whole game, I kid you not, I just prayed in the spirit. And it came down to the last play of the game, mighty Alabama. And we lost because Colt Brennan, well, he, he threw up three times during the game, which doesn't help in 94-degree heat. But he missed Jason Rivers on a corner route. But I'm telling you, I heard stuff from Alabama people sitting behind me. I prayed the whole way. After the game, I told June, I said, man, I prayed. I, I feel like I played. <laughs> I was so wiped out. Now, they lost the game. But I felt real good because I went, well, Lord, it sure wasn't because we didn't try everything and anything. It's just your sovereignty that there will be a victory in what looks like a loss. And some of you, you quit praying because your expectation didn't happen. And God's saying, I'm not finished. Keep praying. The game is not done yet. It's not complete. By the end of the season, Alabama was nowhere to be found. And the University of Hawaii cracked the BCS top 25. Some of you, your prayers, the answers to your prayers are on its way. Some of you, it's the beginning. Some of you are at the midpoint. And some of you, you're at the end point. You're so close. But listen, the closer you get to the actual breakthrough, the bigger the resistance. And many people quit before the barrier busts because the resistance at the end is the strongest. Barrier-busting prayer prays with boldness, nerve, and let me just say this as we close today. Barriers are broken through prayers that are relentless or they don't quit. Scripture says pray without ceasing. Now sometimes we cease because we let reminders of who we were and what we did in our past cloud our thinking that, oh, God can't favor me. Remember what I did. Remember who I was. Wait, well, listen, when the devil reminds you of your past, you remind him of his future, that he ends up in the lake of fire. And then once you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, once the Spirit of God enters your life and you respond to the gospel that Jesus lived the life you should have lived, fulfilling God's law for you. He died the death you should have died, paying the penalty, shed the blood you should have shed for the cleansing of our sin, then was raised again as we're heading to Easter. Three days later, proving to be the Son of God that whoever repents and turns toward Him has eternal life and a relationship where what you did and what you were never happened. It never existed. You are a son and a daughter of the Most High God. You can pray with moxie, brashness, nerve, boldness. Remember, intensity is not insanity. Our father loves to brag and says, look at my son, look at my daughter. She likes me. That's the way it goes. But many of us, we pray weak prayers. We do the first beat. We just peter out. And the Lord said, keep playing. Keep playing. The closer you get, 
the more there is a sense of contradiction that it's over. And I want to say to you, even if what you expected before didn't happen, what you prayed before didn't happen, then even now pick up the prayer again and pray through to break through. We must do this because barriers are broken through prayers that are relentless. Not just restless, but relentless. Jesus goes on in this passage as it ensues. He says, so I say to you, it's a concluding statement, so I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. And the one who finds, and the, to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Persist, persevere, push, pray until something happens. Not pray until you're tired. Pray until something happens. This passage in the original language, we know this, we've said it over and over. It means ask, keep on asking, seek, keep on seeking, knock, keep on knocking, keep on, keep on, keep on. Daniel continued on his face until. He said, well, it hasn't happened before. Well, even now it can, because God can. And we close this series. I, I, I'm telling you, we're gonna, this is the last, second to the last Sunday. Next week's the last Sunday. We leapfrog 30 organizations to be put into this place. People said, you can't happen, you can't happen, they're not gonna take a church. Well, here we've been for 10 and a half years. When we got it, we prayed hard for it. We'd outgrown Momilani School. And I personally was done with not having air conditioning. <laughs> I personally was done with the stink smell of the trash can. God bless you, Doreen, if you're here this morning. We love Momi. You gave us a home when nobody would give us a home. We would have been really on the side of Pearl Harbor and be called Grace Bible Church Pearl Side. We've been, <laughs> we would have church in a park. And for Momi, like, we're here. And now we're going to go from here to there. And that's because there has been, you have fasted and prayed with us. We had a month. We had 10 days recently. And I believe the last 10 days have been critical in opening up the doors for what will be a tremendous victory. Now, I want to talk about two people as we close. One is Ed Onishi. Every time about this year, as we head towards Easter, I tell this story, and Judy, I don't know if you're here, but that's his bride. And Ed, I know it doesn't look like it, but he was the lead drug runner for many years for Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin, and Ray Charles. Asians just have a special thing about them. I, I, I just don't know. Came from Farrington High School, did not graduate because he got into organized business. <laughs> and uh, the way I came to know him was he was dying. He had been in a diving accident. And he lost consciousness underwater, just like Darnisha did. But see, Judy, who was his girlfriend at the time, prayed like the Dickens for him. Because when he came up, they said, he's done, he's done, get your affairs in order. And they opened him up, they saw signs of cancer and they opened him up and inside of him, it was all over him. So I was called in, I was in a small group at Giving Tree when a, a, an ex-con who was in the group, he heard, I, I shared it with him, I said, we got this request that came, up, came across through a friend and he just lit up, he said, I guess he, he, he relate to ex-cons because Ed spent 30 years in federal prison and he said, uh, Let's pray for him, man. God can do it. Now, this is the guys, you know, ex-cons, they, they generally battle guilt like I'm not worthy to pray big prayers. This guy didn't have any problem with that because he understood the gospel. And so he says, let's pray. His name was Robert Peterson. And we prayed. I went down to visit him. I said, Rob, you want to come with me? They had him on that intensive care, that barbecue stick, I call it. They rotate the body. And I was like horrified. I'm thinking, oh, you know, you, you gotta, you know. Now, let me be honest. I was like, let's pray, pray last rites. But see, Judy wouldn't let him go. Judy. Judy, his girlfriend at the time, and I, later on I did their wedding. It was 2002. And she rallied prayer like crazy. And guess what? When I went back six days later, they had discharged him. And I was like, no, no, no. I was, I was at the missions. I'm going, Ed Onishi. Okay, O-N-I-S-H-I. This is at Queens, where they know how to spell. <laughs> and it was like, no, yeah, he's gone. I said, so I call, and, 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 and that's when I got to know Judy. She says, oh my God, thank you so much for praying. They said, not only is he well, the cancer's gone. And I said, I was like, I'm catching up. I said, wait, it's too much information. <laughs> we became good friends. I led him to Jesus. Satellite City Hall, the gems one, that one right there. 
appropriately. And he began to share with me about having seen the Lord, you know, when he, when he drowned and the Lord talked to him and he wasn't saved yet. That you can't get into heaven unless you know Jesus. And so he looked at me and he, essentially he said, so I guess you're the guy. <laughs> and so I was the guy. He became an usher and a greeter in this church, worked for the Job Corps, helping young, gave his last years of his life helping young people turn their lives around. Helped our youth ministry, was very generous. He and Judy got married, did the wedding. And the reason why I bring him up every now and then, it was about this time of year, a little later, a month, give it a month. His last thing he did for us, he helped me preach in our Easter services and then a couple weeks later he passed. And he told me, I know I'm on borrowed time. They still haven't determined why he passed, officially. It wasn't cancer. He beat that three times. He said, here's a guy that really should not have died. He fell out of a fourth-story building, tried to hang himself, and it didn't work. I mean, you know, some people try to die, and they die. He tried to die four times and couldn't. Ridden with guilt, set free because he received Jesus as his Lord and Savior who extended his life so he could fulfill his destiny because his wife, Judy, who girlfriend back then, refused to give up. She kept asking, seeking, and knocking. Judy, I don't know if you stay. I think maybe you were in the earlier service. She was in our Grace Group Summit leaders gathering yesterday. And every time about Easter, I am inspired by the memory of this fellow Farringtonian that the grace of God, it don't matter where you've been, it don't matter. No, listen, he's done everything, including the thing you're thinking about. That's the grace of God, isn't it? And then there's Isaiah Reed, another Pilau guy. <laughs> this is a very good friend of ours. You've heard him preach a lot. Okay? And he's been here. He's been with us since the early 2000s and, and spoken, done stuff not only for us, but our, our Every Nation churches here in Hawaii and other churches because we've pitched him everywhere. And this is his, now his wife, she was the former live-in girlfriend for Jim Brown, the great football player. She came to Jesus, then she came to him. Well, Isaiah 1986, and some of you may remember this if you're old enough, big news in Waikiki, he ran a prostitution ring and a drug dealing ring. He got trained in the military uh, about how to structure things for effective operations and he was phenomenal in the wrong sense. Interesting thing, he grew up being preached to by his parents who were Christians. He was actually, at one point, received the Lord, but then strayed. So the seed of the gospel was in him, and boy, boy did he stray. He strayed really far. And in 1986, he was shot in a limo. The bullet went through his mouth, up through his brain, but missed all the vital portions, and how many of us know that's the Lord? That bullet is still in his brain today. They won't touch it, because it's, and he's normal. So the brain sits in this, the bullet sits in this part of this brain that's just matter that doesn't matter, okay? And then he was stabbed 16 times, 16, let's just Google it, okay? 16 times, and I've had this story, Isaiah and I, and I have sat together for great lengths of time talking about just the whole journey. And he was dead. He was good and dead, he was in the autopsy table. They had cut him open. The mother dialed in the call, she was on the mainland to confirm that is my son. And she said, that's my son, but he's not dead. To which the official said, no, ma'am, he's on the autopsy table. He's dead. She says, no, 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 no. My son has been called to preach. The Lord spoke to me. There's a prophetic word and a call over him. And I want you all to leave the room for the real physician to enter. And they thought she was crazy. And she prayed, not, oh Lord, if it be your will, if you'd be so kind, oh Lord, I rest in your sovereignty. No, she said, Father, and this is Isaiah. I'm going, okay, I don't want, okay, if you're African American here, I, please don't be offended. Okay, I, I proved I got some blackness in me. Green <laughs> black, okay. She said, Isaiah was gone. I mean, I, I, I had tears in my eyes when he was telling me this. Okay, I, you may have tears in your eyes for something. She said, now, Father, you said my son has been called to preach. They said he's dead, 
But it's not what they said, it's what you said. And you said he will be in the ministry. And so, Father, in the name of Jesus, I call him back. Live, son, and fulfill your calling. Okay. (laughs) And he did. Vitals came back. Every year we talk. Coming back soon again. Probably need to have him preach again to remind us of what happens when you pray through to break through. See, that's the kind of prayer Jesus is teaching in Luke 11. Not the kind of prayer that we pray in Hawaii. Oh, Lord, you're so wonderful. You know, there's a place for that. But man, get out some guns. Get out some guns. Give us some funk. Give us some militant funk. Yeah. Yeah. Can you feel it? Some of you pray with no rhythm, no intensity, no beat, no guts, and no substance. Stop that. Start praying like you are the son and daughter of the most high God who has accepted Christ. You have accepted the Christ of all time into your heart who gave his life and gave his blood for your salvation, redemption, atonement, cleansing, and forgiveness. You're special. 